uh, Tanuj. Uh, also, thank you, uh, Professor Namrata and uh, Dr. Manaldit. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, which is Associate Professor Shamira Pereira. Uh, he's from Singapore National Eye Center, and he's also co-head of uh, Bioengineering and Division Devices uh, Division at the Singapore Research Eye Research Institute. And he has actually interest in uh, surgical devices and has actually uh, have a few uh, patents already uh, out from his. Uh, um, biomechanics and also in uh, surgical devices for glaucoma and uh, cataract surgery. And he has also uh, had an award-winning free app uh, module called a Touch Surgery. And uh, I would like to now invite him to speak on surgical uh, challenges in nanothermals. And be because of time, he will just concentrate uh, on uh, uh, phaco emulsification in nanothermals. Over to you, uh, Shamira. Thank you very much, uh, Tanuj, for, uh, and uh, SK for the very kind introductions. So I'll be speaking on FACO in nanothermic eyes. It's great to be here at this meeting. These are my financial disclosures, none of which are relevant to today's talk. Now, nanothermic eyes uh, often develop angle closure in the rate of between 54 to 77%. And this is because of the relatively large lens in a small eye. There are multiple mechanisms at play here, but what we do know is that lens extraction relieves the angle closure very well in nanothermos. Unfortunately, the visual outcomes after cataract surgery in nanothermic eyes are highly unpredictable due to refractive surprises and because of macular changes after the surgery. Now, while some people do disagree about the anatomic classification of nanothermics, most people would say that it counts as any eye with axial lens less than 20.5. There are other features as well that they have in common, typically a small cornea, the shallow anterior chamber depth, marked iris convexity, and they suffer from uveal effusions quite commonly because of the thick and sclera and choroid. Here's an example of two UBMs of uh, eyes I've seen in Singapore. One is a plus 17 adapter refracted patient with a five millimeter lens in a 15.2 millimeter eye. And you can see on the UBM, you can actually even measure the sclera at two millimeters thick. Here's another eye with 15.4 millimeters uh, axial length and a swollen lens with a thickness of 5.2 millimeters. You can see the engorged vessels and the crowded disc at the back. And this is the eye that I'll be showing you the FACO of later on in this presentation. Now we know there are several intraoperative difficulties and precautions that you must take for these eyes. First things first, you have to get your corneal incisions right because tight wound construction and small incision length are very important to providing a stable anterior chamber. This anterior chamber must be monitored at all times and refilled with viscoelastics uh, regularly to maintain the uh, anterior chamber depth. If you don't, and there is any drop in pressure, you can have a serious or hemorrhagic choroidal detachment or even a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. For this, you will need to perform a sclerectomy, and some people recommend a prophylactic sclerostomy, but more about that later. Because of the shallow anterior chamber depth and the risk of endothelial cell loss, some people also propose a soft shell technique with a dispersive cohesive viscoelastic. Now, my tips that I particularly use are, and I think these have been well recognized as quite commonly used by other surgeons, is the use of topical intracameral anesthetics for the surgery. If you're going to use a peribulbar, try and not use too much fluid because these eyes typically have a small orbital size and also small palpable aperture. So you might be making things more difficult for yourself if you put in too much fluid. I routinely use 20% mantle to keep the pressure in the eye down, and I use clear corneal temporal incisions with heavy use of Helon GV or Helon 5 to maintain the AC. I prefer to do the capsulorexis with Kawai force, which is a smaller gauge, and do not shower the AC like the utratus may do. And I'm always making time out to preemptively watch for iris prolapse. Now, there are several controversies about these eyes as well. Some people do like to perform a limited pass plane of vitrectomy to give themselves some space in the anterior chamber, but you have to be very, very careful of this. And I'm not a fan because you can go straight through into the retina if you do this because of the non-existent pass planar. In terms of sclerotomies, I again prefer not to do these until absolutely necessary if there is some shallowing because of the formation intraoperatively of an effusion. But I'm ready for it because I do like to perform sclerectomies, especially in those eyes that have had previous uveal effusions. I prefer to do them square in shape and at the start of the operation. And you do find that actually it does deepen the anterior chamber. 
In terms of the uh, suturing of the wounds, I prefer to do that because you do want to maintain the, the integrity of the globe and you don't want any AC shallowing through any leaks. Now, PCRs are very common. As you can see in one study, it showed that in non-thalamic eyes with axillaries averaging around 20 millimeters uh, in length, they were getting 11.7% of PCRs. And this increased up to 25% in those eyes that are shorter than 17 millimeters. Here's an example of one case, and you'll see me performing a sclerectomy here. This is a 15.4 millimeter nanothalamic eye, in which case there were previous effusions. In fact, the other eye lost vision completely because of uveal effusions. So this is the only eye, and I'm performing these square-shaped screctomies around about 90% depth. I've measured the thickness at about two millimeters, and I'm doing these about four millimeters back. It's harder to get decent size on these because there's just not much space to move. As you can see, I'm very, very close to the uh, choroid there, and if necessary, I can just plunge through by cut down and relieve any fluid that's accumulating in the suprachoroidal space. There was one such study that looked at randomizing patients to a sclerostomy versus no sclerostomy. And although it's small numbers, you can see that there were actually less complications in the sclerostomy group. This didn't quite achieve statistical significance though, but the idea it being that it allows any accumulated suprachoroidal fluid to leak out. Here's me performing the remainder of that operation. You can see that I'm, I'm performing a, a, an initiation of the capsorexis with a needle here, and I'm always wearing of the capsorexis tearing out, which is a common thing that can happen in these eyes. I'm using a kawai forceps, which is a small gauge and doesn't allow showering of the anterior chamber. I've done the screctomies already, and the AC has deepened. Here I'm watching out for iris prolats and I've put in specifically these iris hooks to keep the pupil size bigger. The phaco goes well and I put in the lens here, which is a, 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 a acrylic lens. At that point, I actually have a look at the fundus to see if there's any you feel if you're forming that aren't, but I've probably taken too long over it. And when I come out, I can see the AC shallowing. And that's why I put some extra sutures in the wound to maintain its integrity there. In terms of the refractive outcomes, you can see that there are complications with unpredictable uh, and um, uh, uh, refractive surprises. You can see in this studies, both have shown a greater than 40% uh, of eyes achieve a refraction within one data of the target refraction. They use the SRKT here. And actually, against what we were taught previously, it seems that the Hoffa Q doesn't do so well in these eyes. The best one is the Kane formula in one study, and then the Barrett does well as well. In terms of the eye well, choice and placement, you can go for two options, either both implants in the bag or piggyback, which means one in the sulcus. The both in the bag does suffer from some problems with intractable interlenticular membranes and a late hypertrophic shift because of a uh, contraction of the bag. But the aim here is used for different materials. If you're going for a single lens approach, which you can do, a single lens in the bag, then you can use a mortar lens, which offers a very high diopteric, perhaps to 75 diopters, but it has a large incisive size, which is a negative thing. The Zeiss Extreme D is a very popular lens that's, that covers, a, again, a very large dioptric range, and this is very commonly used. The Alcon SA60, which is what I use in this case, goes up to plus 40. That can be very useful for a placement in the bag, and then you've got another lens for the sulcus. This is what these piggyback lenses look like in the longer term. I use this Hicksoak Pro lens calculator for multiple lenses, and that tells you exactly what power lens to use for the bag and then which one to use for the sulcus as well. From lenses in the sulcus, you've got about three options, the sulcoflex, the sensor, and the star lens. And the sulcoflex is specifically made for the sulcus. It has these undulating haptics, which don't cause much damage. It has a very large optic size and a posterior concave surface. The AMO sensor lens has this opti-edge round of front, which is meant to reduce the amount of pigment dispersion. And you've got this very, very thin star lens, which is made of silicone, very soft material, again, which is very atraumatic. In terms of complications, we know that these are greatly increased in this difficult, challenging eyes. And in one study, there was malignant glaucoma occurring in almost 10% of cases, vitreous hemorrhage in another 10, and vitreous hemorrhage and retinal detachment in almost 5%. So that's a very high rate of complications. In another study, which actually employed a PI and an anterior vitrectomy in many cases, they were still getting 7% of PCRs occurring. So in conclusion, we really need to use our imaging and surgical technologies, and these are improved outcomes for such challenging eyes. Nathalmic eyes do represent a significant surgical challenge and a high rate of intraoperative complications. Fortunately, the, un the unpredictability of IWAL power calculation has been uh, worked around with better formulae.
Thank you very much.